Hello, this is Hal Richardson. We're continuing with our study, Anchor for the Soul. This is lesson two in the series. Our base scripture is Hebrews 6, 17 through 20, wherein God willing more abundantly to show under the heirs of promise, the immutability, immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters entereth into that within the veil whither the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We talked last week about the tabernacle and the ark of God and at how Jesus had now entered that heavenly holy of holies for us to intercede for us. But we had to go there to explain because the book of Hebrews was written to those that knew these things already, and a lot of us in Christianship today don't know those things about the tabernacle, and the holy of holies, the holy place, etc. So the two immutable things in our base scripture in Hebrews 6:17 is the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ of which reminds of, of all that he has done for us. And with this, he brought forth our redemption into the heavenly tabernacle and was a ransom for our soul, not only for the sacrifice of our sins, but he now is the high priest forever that intercedes for us before God. In Hebrews 9.11 but Christ, being come as a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, and neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul, had a revelation of this fact and tells us about it. And as I've already said in the last lesson, I believe Paul is the one that wrote to the Hebrews here. All of his other letters were for the Gentiles, but yet this one was for the Jews, the letter of the Hebrews. Saul was on his way persecuting Christians for the Judean church when Jesus Christ met him on the road and had a blinding light and blinded him and told him about himself that he was the Lord, that Jesus was the Lord. And so Paul wrote half the New Testament after the Lord had changed his name from Saul to Paul. Well, he had the revelation. And in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. He sees the communion and the Last Supper of the Lord. And you see pictures here of the Last Supper a couple different ways it would help you remember. For I have received of the Lord, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it. And he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show the Lord's death 
till he come. So now let's talk about faith, hope, and love. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, which is also known as the love chapter, we read by Paul, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, and now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abides faith, hope, and charity, which means love, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now this charity here that Paul talks about is actually in Greek agape, which is the God kind of love, love by choice, not by anything done to deserve it. We've already seen in our study here that Jesus is our hope, the hope in him. He's the anchor. He is the anchor of our soul. In 1 Thessalonians 1.3, Paul also writes, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. One more of faith, hope, and love. The Bible is very stringent that these three things are of paramount importance in our lives. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. We see again in scriptures the importance of faith, hope, and love. They are interdependent on one another in the things that we do in our Christian lives and the things that we do daily need to be inspired and guided and led by these things. And we also know that without faith, it is impossible to please God in Hebrews 11, 6. Not only it's impossible to please God without faith, when you come to God, you've got to first believe in him, and then you've got to believe that he's a rewarder of those that diligently, with all their hearts, seek him. For us to really study faith, we've got to know what its definition is. For that, we need to go to the faith chapter, which is Hebrews 11, and in verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we see here that faith is the substance of things hoped for, so you have to hope in order to have faith. And all things in the kingdom of God work by love. Because in 1 John 4, 8, it says that God is love. And he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So we see then how they're all joined together. Our faith, hope, and love. And that we have to have hope in order to exercise our faith. And yet the whole system works by love because God is love and because of the love he had for his son his son is our eternal salvation and the spirit of his son now lives in our heart our hope lies in what Jesus and God have promised us 
and the belief in the finished work of Jesus for all we need in this life. Hoping for and using your faith produces evidence in your heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus said that in Luke 6.45. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. Things spoken in faith and believed will come to pass. In Mark 11:23, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that all those things which he saith will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that ye receive them, and you will have them. One of my early mentors was Kenneth Hagin. God rest his soul. He's gone now. But he was very famous for preaching, you can have what you say in Mark eleven twenty three. 23. If you dig into the Word of God and you find the things that God has promised, you can be assured that the prayers that you pray concerning those promises will be answered, and those answers will be yes and amen. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 1.20, For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. In all of things and in the time of trouble, we need to trust in the Lord. He is faithful and will never leave you and never forsake you. In Hebrews 13.5 So in all we've studied, we see that Jesus is truly the anchor for our soul. If you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you're not part of the royal family, invite Jesus in your heart today. This is Hal Richardson. Join me next time as we continue in the Anchor for the Soul. Bye for now.